first of all, I want to thank uh, Jim for, you know, for uh, the American Veterans Center doing this. Uh, you know, you, you're, you're really, as you know, you're getting treated to a tremendous uh, event here. And we too honor the veterans, um, the wounded warriors, the survivors of Pearl Harbor, the Medal of Honor winners, um, those from those that have gone on and, and done successful work in uh, the civilian world and the corporate world. So that's just incredible to bring everybody together. And you know it takes a lot of effort to do that. Um, and I think to tell the great stories of those veterans who succeeded not only in war, but of course, even after they've transitioned, um, is important, whether it's in peace, whether it's in industry, or in all lines of work. Um, and I think you need to know we still have tremendous backing of this country. Um, you know, the opinion, all the polls, if, if you're a pollster or whatever, but everywhere you go, the opinion of veterans and of servicemen and women in uniform is absolutely the highest. And I can honestly tell you that in 1981, when I came into service, it wasn't even close. I can guarantee you nobody was thanking us for our service. If they were, it was probably someone in our family. Uh, but nobody was thanking us for our service, and it has changed monumentally. So, I mean, I don't take that for granted when someone thanks me for my service. It may sound like a slogan, but I'll tell you what, it, it means a lot, you know, for those of us that have been around a little bit. Um, there's tremendous employment opportunities, and I'm not saying this because I want you to go into the service and I want you to do well, but even as you think about our, our, our Marines, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen getting out, transitioning, after four years, most of them do transition, uh, the officers, et cetera. But there's, there's incredible programs out there to help them, to, to train them, to troops to teachers, troops to truckers. Um, Howard Schultz Foundation, anybody know who Howard Schultz is? What's he own? Starbucks. You got it, Starbucks. He's, and he's got a lot of money. So what he does is he's at six different locations, six large bases around the country right now. And what's he do? He takes, he takes uh, soldier, sailors, Marines, and airmen about three to four months from their EAS, their extended active service date, when they leave. And he starts training them in all kinds of things, the service industry, the technology industry. That's just one example. There's lots of them out there. The support organizations, the, the folks you have out in front there today, the veteran service organizations, the, the military service organizations, the nonprofits, it's, it was not like that, that's what I'm telling you. So it's, don't ever take that for granted. Um, as far as being a Marine, it's a great time to be a Marine right now. Um, and we certainly appreciate the invitation to come. Uh, we have a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a Marine who's got an incredible vision for the future. And he's dealing with some incredibly challenging, um, I would say a very challenging national security environment worldwide. It's not just a counterterrorism fight anymore. It's potential fights with what we would call peer competitors and near peer competitors. It's a very challenging world out there. We need every one of you out there in uniform helping to defend our country and our interests. Um, we have a new commandant today. I think I need to tell you that he's got a future focus that I would say is comparative to the interwar years between World War I and World War II. Now, what happened to the Marine Corps that was significant in those interwar years is that we developed amphibious doctrine. We developed amphibious warfare in conjunction with the Navy. And that was a monumental achievement for us because we took the lessons from places like Gallipoli and other disasters that had happened out there and lives that were lost but not in vain and we applied them to amphibious warfare through World War II and, and throughout today. We're, we are looking at lots of the new technologies out there, and of course you really have to change your doctrine, your training, um, your employment, your equipment to really have a revolutionary change. We're starting to think that that period is coming right now. I'm talking about information warfare, I'm talking about cyber warfare, I'm talking about electronic warfare, I'm talking about the potential of taking a of reducing the size of a rifle platoon, making assistant squad leaders that are basically in charge of all that technology that's gonna be at your fingertips. And we're talking about a lot of capabilities potentially out there today. So we are in the midst of looking at some very impactful changes, particularly in how we conduct warfare. Um, so and what it's really about is, is maintaining our asymmetrical advantage. And we have such an asymmetrical advantage, um, but it's, it's eroding somewhat. And we've, gone, we've well gone past the, the first, what I would say, offset strategy, which was having the nuclear weapons. Uh, we went to the second offset strategy, which was really having uh, 
precision guided munitions, uh, stealth technologies, things like that. Basically, our, our peer competitors have caught up with us. Anybody know what the Chinese J-20 is? There you go. Look, a lot of this is great, you all know. But they've got fifth generation fighters. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting, if you take a look at the design of some of their latest equipment, what's it look like? Well, you got you hit the nail on the head. Why is that? You got, this is great. You guys know exactly what's going on. So I don't really have to talk to you too much about that, but warfare is going to continue to change. And you probably have heard the Secretary of Defense talk a lot about the force of the future and, and attracting, retaining, uh, recruiting the best people. Why? Because we want that third, we want that third offset strategy. Are we going to have sleeper drones out there? What are we going to have for hypersonics? What are we going to have for robotics? All that is coming up right now, and it's here. You know, I'm telling you right now, it's here. So how are we going to employ it to our advantage? You can have all this great technology, but if you can't make it work together to the benefit of the infantrymen on the ground, you're not going to make it, which kind of brings me to today. Um, I'm glad we're here for a leadership panel. Um, it's a, I would say that leadership is a lifelong education. Um, and just to let you know, I'm not going to talk about myself because no, nobody wants to hear a general talk about themselves. Um, but I will tell you that I've worked for some of the, what I would say, the best leaders in the Marine Corps, whether it was General Mattis, whether it was General John Kelly of Southcom, um, whether it was General Waldhauser, who runs Af AFRICOM right now. I'm very privileged to do that. Um, and I've also worked for some great, work with some great sergeants majors. And that's why it's very important you notice we have two staff non-commissioned officers on the panel today. Um, along with the two officers. So what I'm going to do is just introduce them each a little bit. I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about themselves and tell you whatever leadership antidote or whatever is important to them today. And uh, we'll go through each of the panelists. And then uh, my intent is to open it up for questions. If you don't have questions, i got a few here. But uh, we really want to hear what, you have to, what your questions are. It sounds like you're pretty educated from your responses to some of the things I brought up earlier. So like I said, the success of this is, is really per your questions and uh, what you want to hear from us. So first, uh, we have uh, Captain Robert Epstein. Um, Robert's a Naval Academy distinguished graduate. He's an intelligence officer. He's completed recent tours in Afghanistan with the 1st Marine Division. He's got a master's degree in information technology, which he got from the Naval Postgraduate School. And now he works in Marine Corps recruiting. And he probably has a good idea of how we want to employ some of these capabilities I just talked about in the future, given his uh, specialty. So I'm going to turn it over to Captain Epstein. And Thank you, sir. How are we all doing? Uh, it's a little sleepy. Everyone up? <laughs> Sit down. And up. And down. OK, how's everyone doing? OK, rah. Hi, right, again, Captain Robert Epstein. Uh, General Sir, thank you for the kind introduction. I uh, just want to make sure we're all, all awake, uh, talk about topics near and dear to our hearts, leadership. Um, as the general mentioned, uh, I grew up actually in McLean, Virginia, so pretty local kid. Went to the Naval Academy in 2008, uh, joined the Marine Corps. Uh, after the basic school and intelligence officer training, I went down to 1st Marine Division in the G2 and uh, did combat ops with them in Afghanistan from 2010 to 2011. Quick turn, right back out with 2nd uh, Battalion, 4th Marines as the assistant intel officer, uh, right back to Afghanistan. and was there from uh, late 2011 into early 2012. So after that, Naval Postgraduate School. So yes, you know, education continues for all of you who think, you know, one day I'll graduate you know, my academy or, or my alma mater and be done with that academics. And I'll get to be a, just a military officer and enjoy leading troops. Uh, it's not true. You will go back to education. You need to go back to education because the world changes. Um, we need to stay at the forefront and fighting edge. Um, so now doing a payback tour with information technology management. Again, I was a history major, intel officer. IT is not necessarily my, uh, my chosen field. But uh, as, again, as General Rourke mentioned, uh, it's here, it's here to stay. And we in the services have got to get out front of it rather than be reactive to it. So between acquisitions, between prototyping, and between kind of weaponizing it as a capability, we certainly need to, to delve in a little bit more than we have. Uh, as far as leadership, and I don't want to belabor the point you've been hearing about leadership all day, uh, I'm going to keep my points pretty simple. And what I'd say about leadership, first of all, you have to have the mutual respect between the leaders and the led. Okay? It's not simply you know, your rank on your shoulders that makes them follow you. Yes, Congress you know, requires them to render 
obedience to, to orders and directives, but that's not why people follow you and that's not why they're going to sacrifice. Okay, They're going to sacrifice, one, because they are motivated, because they're intelligent, because they're driven. We select the best. We train them. And through hard training, we screen out the ones who thought they liked it and really aren't cut for it. Uh, but really, it's because they believe in you and the mission. And you can't give them certainty, but what you can give them is the best plan possible. So you owe it to your sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, uh, soldiers, the, the very best plan that, uh, that you can come up with. And so you know, as uh, has been said, you know, burn that midnight oil. You know, and the, the, tear, you know, the, the sweat and tears you, you kind of excrete now are going to pay dividends, and you'll bleed less in war. Uh, but on that note, you know, that respect is engendered because of your personal example. So there's no on switch for leadership. And you're all right now uh, you know, leading and learning leadership. So take notes. And I don't just mean you know, mental notes and, oh, yeah, that was good. Like, write it down. Refer to it later. If you don't have a little, little notebook of good and bad leadership that you've seen, uh, then you're wrong. Because I'll tell you that when you're faced with the leadership problem is the last time and the wrong time to be thinking, oh, oh God, what do I do? Okay, so you need to have these things ingrained, imbued in you as a, as a core operating concept that I'm a leader and as such I seek responsibility, I take responsibility, I communicate clearly and effectively. So again, you, your people will respect that in you and they need to see you live it. And if you're just putting up a face and you're, you know, you're a leader from nine to five when you're in the building in uniform and then you want to go home, you know, and you know, Shirk, shirk all those responsibilities and, hey, I don't want to be bothered, uh, then this probably isn't the career for you. So a quick deployment anecdote then. So if you're going to live your values and live leadership, and you can't just do it uh, 9 to 5, you can't just do it when it's convenient. Um, as an intelligence officer with 2-4, uh, one of the biggest threats that we had to our mission accomplishment was the IED, right, the improvised explosive device. Um, it's a weapon like any other. I mean, it has psychological uh, ramifications. It certainly had you know, physical ramifications, but it also restricted our movement, right? So instead of the aggressive maneuver warfare that we like to operate with, you're now confined to walking single file, walking behind the guy with the metal detector. And that's certainly not the way you want to get into a village. Um, you lose the element of surprise. You lose the speed. And the mass are so critical to success in war. Uh, more than that, it would isolate us from our target populations, right? You have X number of villages. Y number of miles you can walk in a day, and then the real determining factor is your pace. So if you're slowed down, you just can't get there because you're walking single file, methodically, you know, footstep by footstep. So what did we do? We decided, you know, we're going to use some, some of those technologies I'm really not going to talk about, but we, we would dev uh, devise pretty uh, creative paths through pretty rough terrain. Uh, and you know, the key there is everyone's obviously nervous, so who's going who's gonna to walk point, right? Who's going to walk first through the dark, over the rough terrain, to get to the objective? And it's easy. You know, especially as an officer, you could, you know, you could let the, the Marine with the, the metal detector do it. And by policy, that guy's going to be out front. And you can stand back in the back and watch the formation. But especially as the battalion intel officer, who do you think designed those trails? Who do you think gave it to those platoons and companies that these are the routes you should take, right? Well, I did. Right, that's one of your roles. Like, do the mobility studies, figure the ways that they should go, and minimize our chance of hitting one of these things. So, wouldn't it make sense, right? You should walk probably second. Like, I, I'm not, you know, I wasn't trained with the, with the CMD there, but I was right up there in the front. And I'll tell that to you know, pat myself on the back. The lesson is you have to live it. They can't just say, yeah, these are the things the captain or the lieutenant gave me. Like, they see you. This is your plan. You'd better have confidence in it. If, even if no one else does. And sometimes you have to show that confidence. So again, lead from the front and live your values. It's not enough simply to preach it. You have to live it. Uh, my next point is about uh, taking care of your people. So again, that's the two-way respect. They will work hard for you, and they will work hard to accomplish the mission if they know that you will take care of them too. And uh, this is a little not off told story, but and one of the many things you'll do as an officer is being in an office, right? That, that office work. So if you haven't gotten good at the correspondence manual or whatever other 
uh, admin bureaucratic processes that you've encountered in a limited basis thus far, I encourage you to, to get good at it because quick, efficient staff work is often the way through a problem. Um, but one of the other ones is recognizing your people for the good things that they do. And that's a way to take care of them because that means promotion, it means advancement, it can mean pay and benefits okay, for them and their families, and that makes a difference. Uh, so you know, make sure that you recognize your people. And sometimes it's not always a popular thing. Okay? In one of the battalions I was with, you know, there was an untold rule of awards were commensurate with rank. Right? That if you're a, you know, if you're a lance corporal or below, you probably, unless you do some you know, heroic, you probably aren't going to get any award. You know, you're a corporal above, maybe you get a Navy Achievement Medal. You know, sergeants, staff sergeants, gunnies, probably Navy Com, right? Really didn't matter unless it was a specific heroic achievement. You probably weren't going to get anything other than that. So I had a young Marine. Uh, he'd actually done a year of law school, highly educated, again, indicative of the caliber of folks you're going to be out there leading. And he was doing the job that I would probably have reserved for a lieutenant. Okay, phenomenal job doing collections and asset management, and putting together the battalion's uh, intelligence collection plan, running, scheduling the assets, and then putting them into products for, for use that drove our ops. Uh, again, a function I would probably have reserved for a lieutenant. Uh, but he was doing this as a Lance Corporal. So you, know, you put him in for a Navy Commendation Medal, which, again, you're going to initially meet with organizational resistance to a thing like that. Not because they won't read the, read the award write-up, but because uh, there's a, you know, an ingrained view that that's not what's done. Right? That, well, that's just a Lance Corporal. Um, so ultimately, you know, working and you know, kind of in a way putting myself, my reputation on the line, we were able to get that Marine the recognition that, uh, that he deserved. And you know, not that, again, not to pat myself on the back, you know, what a good officer I am. It's much more that that Marine and more importantly, all the other Marines saw that good, hard, creative work is rewarded, it's recognized, and that, that also let that Marine advance fa as fast as he, as he could in the Marine Corps, gave him more opportunities, let him do schools, get additional training, and fulfill his career. So that's the back end of leadership. You know, it's not just the get up, you know, let's take the hill, follow me. That's the stuff you see in the movies. But then there's the quiet, persistent, caring about your people and taking care of them, even sometimes at your own expense, that's also necessary. And that then also ties into the two-way respect. They will respect you, they will work for you, and word will get out and you'll get to a new command and your people will already know who you are, and then you have to continue to earn their trust. So again, as, you know, as future officers, you will walk into a room and you're you know, granted the privilege bequeathed to you by generations of former officers that the people will automatically hold you in respect and esteem until you prove otherwise. Okay, so you're already given that respect, you just have to earn it and hold it and give it to the next person. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Master Sergeant Jimmy Cuevas. Master Sergeant Cuevas is a 19-year veteran of the Marine Corps. He's been assigned to the Officer Candidate School as a young Marine. He was also at the U.S. Joint Forces Command when we had it in Norfolk. Now it's part of the Joint Staff. The Marine Forces Central Command in Bahrain. And he's also served as an aide-de-camp to the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. I think it was Sergeant Major Estrada, which must have been a very interesting experience. And uh, he served in Iraq with a police transition team. At that time, we were training uh, the Iraqis to become policemen. And I'm not sure where we got the training for that, because uh, it's not his MOS specialty there, but I'm sure that's some good story as well. And he currently is the assignments monitor for the public affairs field. Without further ado, um, Master Sergeant Cuevas. Well, thank you, General. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you for your remarks, sir. I, uh, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, I don't have a, a master's, I'm working on my bachelor's, kind of slow learner. Um, I call myself a uh, jack of all trades, master of none, so there's my master's right there. Uh, like the general said, I was at OCS, uh, I joined the Marine Corps August 18th, uh, 1997, so my parents actually had to sign a waiver for me to join the military. Uh, I wanted to follow, uh, follow my father's footsteps, he did 28 years in the Navy, hurrah. He was uh, worked on uh, on subs. He was a uh, guided missile cruiser on a ship. He was an SK, and then uh, he finished up his career with a sublant five. I said to myself, uh, my brother and sister went into the medical field. wasn't very smart, so I'm like, 
Next best thing is the, uh, the military. So when I told my dad I wanted to join the Marine Corps, his words were, you're not going to make it. Uh, so when I went, I graduated. He finally told me uh, that was the proudest day of uh, his life. Um, but my first due station was OCS. Uh, I got a chance to see General Jones' son graduate and General Zini, who was the uh, Joint Chief of Staff at the time, his son go through. So as a young 18-year-old man, uh, that uh, leaves a lasting impression because as an enlisted Marine, we're always looking for that leadership. So one day, my eyes and I was there when they graduated, I told myself, those are the future leaders of the Marine Corps. One day, I'm going to be working for them or her, and hopefully they can lead me in the right direction. And if we go to war, hopefully they can take me and make sure I come back home. So you today, we share a common bond, whether you, whether you know it or not. We all raised our hand, and someone said, trust. Trust comes from the bond that we all share in this room. We all raised our right hand and swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That is where your trust comes. That is why I love being a Marine and love serving my country. After OCS, I went to uh, Joint Forces Command, literally that I know. Uh, I was the, the only Marine there. Uh, working with the Air Force, Army, and the Navy. I was a young E-4, didn't know what I was doing. I was in charge of 88 Marines. And believe it or not, I was in charge to make sure their uh, EPRs and fitness reports were good to go, written correctly, and that's me with no uh, college education. Go me. Uh, after that, I went to Manam, Bahrain. This was back in 2004. The war was kicking off. My job was a five-man crew. It was a colonel, major, a staff sergeant, and myself. My job personally was for casually tracking. I used to get maybe 500 emails a day of every single Marine that got injured out there. Now, as a 20-year-old you know, man, that kind of messes with you. Like, uh, I didn't know anything about Iraq, and I started getting emails about people drowning. And I looked at my colonel, I was like, sir, is there water in Iraq? <laughs> he said, there is. Uh, after uh, um, uh, but Bahrain, I met the Sergeant Major Marine Corps. Uh, he had a meeting to go to. And uh, he was getting changed over. He got a phone call from the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who was General Hagee at that time. He said, hey, uh, I'm leaving in five minutes. Uh, hopefully, you, you make the plane and you come back home. So he's like, can anyone drive here? So I drove him. Drove to the plane, beat the commandant, and that's how my uh, resume started. I got interviewed on the spot, got the job, and in six months, I'm at the Pentagon working for a Sergeant Major Marine Corps. Best duty and best time of my life. After that, I went to uh, Lejeune, uh, and this is where the uh, police transition team comes. Uh, I'll, I'll back it up. Uh, 2001, I was in JFCOM, 9-11 uh, came about. Two days later, they needed uh, people to volunteer for security. I volunteered. I uh, did a cadre duty. Uh, they taught me how to be an auxiliary police officer. And for nine months, I was at the front gate saying hi, everyone, telling them to come through or you can't come on. So that's where my military background comes from, sir. Um, so I went to Lejeune. Uh, they found out they had some police training. And we went out there to Iraq in January 2007 with the police transition team 22. Our job was to go with the Iraqi Highway Patrol and every other day, we would drive from the Syrian border to Baghdad, every other day. And our job was to make sure that highway was clear. Now, no more convoys drive 30 miles an hour. We drove 75 in a Humvee that had no AC. Sometimes the common gear went down. But we wanted to make sure that we could put different police stations along the highway so the Iraqis can quickly engage their, their provinces or their cities uh, in, a, in a quick manner of time. After that, uh, I went to Pensacola, Florida, where I became the substance abuse control officer, SACO, for anyone who had a drug-related incident or alcohol problem. And I became an equal opportunity representative. And I was also the admin chief. And after that, I'm here as the enlisted monitors. Uh, our job is dealing with people on a daily basis, moving them where they need to be. I'm currently the drill instructor, Staff NCO Academy, and the AMOI monitor. So if you have a Marine at your school and they're not doing a good job, you can blame me. 
Um, but I, I'm humbled to be here. Uh, I used to work for General Pace, who you had a, a brief with not too long ago. And uh, I'm honored to answer any questions you may have. Uh, I leave you with my favorite leadership quotes, and this is a leadership panel. It's from uh, General uh, George Payton. Who knows who that is? You know what quote I'm going to say? He said, leave me, follow me, or get out of my way. That is my favorite quote. Leadership, you, in order to be a great leader, you have to be a great follower. You have to have a great communication between the officer and senior enlisted. Who here is married? Okay, put your hands down. Who here has a cell phone? There you go. Mm -hmm. So it, what's the biggest thing between a relationship? Uh, what, what can break a, a good relationship is communication. Without good, good communication, everything will fall apart. Trust will fall apart. Okay? So you have to have that good communication between yourself, the senior leaders, and your senior enlisted in order to make sure that your command will go strong. And I have no doubt in my military mind that our great country is in good hands with you here in the AC today. Thank you. Right. OK, next we have uh, Gunnery Sergeant John Shields. Uh, Gunny Shields is a 17-year veteran of the Marine Corps. He served in Okinawa. He served in the European Command on embassy duty with the Embassy Security Group. He's deployed with the Special Operations Command, U.S. Central Command, to Iraq. And he has a master's degree in public affairs. Yes, a master's degree. Uh, and by the way, I think he probably has the hardest job in Quantico right now. He's the separation staff NCO. And, uh, and without further ado, Gunny. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as he said, my name is Gunnar Sonar Shields. Uh, I currently serve as the uh, separation staff in COIC at the uh, IPAC on Quantico, which means I'm the most loved and hated person in the, uh, on the base. Uh, loved because I give them their, their ticket out and hated because I make them leave. Uh, that'll make more sense as you uh, progress through your career. Everybody wants to go, but nobody wants to leave. Uh, and it's, uh, it stems from the the experiences that you gain throughout your, throughout your lifetime in the military, the, the experiences that you gain, the camaraderie that you have. Uh, I started that camaraderie back in 1999, uh, long before most of you could speak. Um, but it was, a, it was an eye-opening experience for me. I walked out of a poor neighborhood into a, into a culture I'd never experienced, never even knew existed really, until my older brother said, hey, I want to get promoted. Come down here and sign this contract for me. What do you mean? No, just, just come down here, you sign this contract, you go to boot camp, I get promoted, we go, I outrank you, it's good. Uh, little did I know later, uh, I would quickly outtake him, and uh, he's still a sergeant, so I'm okay with that. Um, the things that I've learned throughout my career have, have, uh, have not been things that I've um, been taught, not in the traditional sense. All of you sit in a classroom each day, you take notes, you learn, you read from the books, but those are the things that you're expected to learn. The things that are really important that you will learn in your career, uh, whether you decide to stay in for 20, 30, 40 years, whether you get out after four years, after your commitment's up, those are the things that are told to you by those around you. Um, I'll say this. The very first time I was ever given uh, one of my personal leadership traits, or personal leadership principles, and I have three of them that I've developed over my 17 years, was when a Marine came up to me, and he said, hey, I want you to be my re-enlistment. Okay, I'd love to be there. I'd love to support you. And he told me, and the entire crowd there, he wanted to thank me for my leadership. <clears throat> and what he wanted to thank me for was setting expectations, but never setting limitations. What does that mean? Well, if you have an expectation, you've given everybody a foundation, right? A foundation is extremely important because you can build a building, you can build a skyscraper and a foundation. But if you set a limitation, you give them a ceiling. You might only be able to build a shack. If you have an expectation, you can walk strong, you can walk tall, you can see the entire universe. If you've given a limitation, the only thing you can see is the popcorn on your 1970s ceiling in your bedroom. It's, it's no fun, right? The many things that I've learned uh, have also come from books. I know you all read. Uh, you, it's kind of a requirement of your job. Don't ever stop reading, okay? Reading is the most important thing you can ever do. Don't just read about the military. Don't read about, read about leadership. 
Some of the most important leadership traits I've ever learned have been reading books about psychology, reading books about biology, about human instinct, about animal instinct. Those are the things that are going to carry you because you have to infer all these different things that the men and women around you are going to do. They're going to respond to you in a different way. Uh, I wish I could recall the name of the movie, but there's a movie I watched a long time ago, and there's a general officer. He brought in his, he brought in his individual, uh, his commanders, and he said, I'm gonna, I got this mission, and I don't think it can be done. I don't think anybody can accomplish it, but I'm going to give it to you because I know you're dedicated. Which scenes? Comes in, another commander. He says, I'm going to give this to you because I know you're the greatest commander I have, and I know you can accomplish it. That general officer knew exactly what he needed to tell each one of his commanders in order to get the mission done. And you notice it wasn't the same thing. And it will never be the same thing. Every one of your subordinates will always respond to a different way. You're not going to be able to know every single Marine or you know, soldier, sailor, airman. You're not going to know everybody underneath you. But what you will know is that you have immediate subordinates who will, who will take the time to know those Marines, those soldiers, sailors, airmen. They will understand everything that they need to know in order to make those people shine, to make them the star. One of the last things that I'd like to impart on you is uh, leadership, it, it's not given to you. Okay? Uh, as the captain said earlier, it's, it's not the, the rank insignia that you have on your collar or on your, on your sleeve. It's the willingness of those who you're supposed to lead to follow you. Through their sublime actions, you become great. Okay? They cannot be great on their own, so they need your support. They need you to provide them the, the courage to stand up for them, as was mentioned earlier. The courage to not only stand up for them, but to be open to them. If you cannot, as a leader, accept criticism for those, from those that you lead, you have failed. You have failed them and yourself. Because you'll never be able to grow unless you can accept criticism. And with that said, that's all I have. Thank you. OK, and uh, last we have Captain David Pham. Captain Pham is a Georgia Tech NROTC graduate. He's an infantry officer. He's a former aide-de-camp to the CG, the commanding general of 2nd Marine Division, General Lukeman. And he's currently the executive officer of a company of a training company of second lieutenants at the basic school in Quantico. He's a combat wounded veteran of Afghanistan who has also found time to make a recruiting video for the Marine Corps. And uh, one of the quotes that I found in the internet that he said straight out of college was, that infantry officers are thrown into a platoon of combat veterans and expected to lead immediately. Without further ado. I said that, sir? <laughs> Warriors, how are we doing today? Uh, head, you hit, Ted, you hit it real quick. Thank you. Okay. Gotta wake y'all up.
Thanks, Ted. All right, Warriors, so you're probably wondering why did I spend seven minutes of my time up here and three minutes of it I was showing you a video, All right? Can some of y'all guess why I did that? Go, give me some, some participation. What's up, Warrior? Absolutely right. It is not just what they're doing. It's who they are. That was 1st Battalion, 8th Marines. That was my battalion. Okay, I see a 6th Marines guy right there. Right? This is who you're leading. Okay? In a year or two, you're going to be standing in front of these Marines, and they're going to be looking at you saying, Sir, ma'am, what now? Right? That's why we're here, and that's the importance of leadership. From this point on, it's no longer about yourself. Okay? And thank you for the, uh, the intro, sir, but that's all you're going to know about me. You can look at my bio later. We can talk later. But I'm a grunt, and right now I'm teaching lieutenants at the basic school. Everything else you need to know is about those Marines. You have to find out everything about them. You have to take care of their families, and you have to get them ready for combat. The Marine Corps has got two jobs, to win America's battles and to bring home its sons and daughters. And as a 22, 23-year-old, that is a huge responsibility. You have to look at yourself and say, am I good enough to lead Mass Sergeant and Gunny over here? Am I good enough for them to call me sir or ma'am? Okay. And I know you can do it. Uh, who's, who's been kind of wrapped in and kind of angry that they get, they're get, they get called the uh, entitled generation? All right. Who's tired of hearing that? Okay. Do I think y'all are entitled generation right now? No, because y'all are in uniform. You raise your hands, and you volunteered for this. You're the ones who want to sacrifice yourself and everything else so you can lead these Marines. Prove them wrong. There's 40 other captains like me waiting for some of y'all right now at the basic school, waiting for y'all to come to us so we can get you ready. I get six months. After you finish OCS, I finish the academy. Hey, we'll take everybody from every single service school. We've had Air Force Academy guys come through, guys and gals come through our school. You could always switch over. <laughs> Absolutely. We want you to. Okay? But for those six months, everybody gets put on a level playing field. We will break it down from the buddy pair level all the way up to platoon tactics. And besides tactics, we teach you how to be a good leader. Ted, can you put up that slide deck for me, please? Thank you. We teach you how to be a humble leader that has compassion. Okay. These are the horizontal themes of the basic school. I don't know how well you can see right now. As the CEO always says in my school, it's the first among equals is be a man or woman of exemplary character. When you have that purity of heart, when you're able to look inside and you're put in the worst situation in the world and you're able to make the right decision and take care of those Marines, those are the leaders we're looking for. Okay. This will be up here for a while and we, you could get them from me afterwards as well. You have to have that purity of heart going into combat. And that starts here. That starts at your service schools. For me, it started at Georgia Tech. I had incredible gunnies and staff sergeants mentor me. Hey, sir, or, hey, Ms. Shipman, you better listen to those NCOs. Those sergeants and corporals know what they're doing. Your job is to make decisions so they can get the job done, but you better trust them and take care of them. And that's what they told me when I was in college. And I'm ever thankful for it. Okay. All right, devoted to leading Marines 24-7. This uniform doesn't come off. You might go out in town, you might put on your civvies, but this uniform does not come off. Okay? You're always wearing the Eagle Open Anchor. When you see a Marine out there at a bar and he's too drunk for his own good and he starts getting in a fight, what do you do? What do you do, Ms. Shimon? Yeah, you stop and you help him. We just don't let them get in trouble, right? We freaking call him an Uber. Everybody's got a cell phone, right? Get an Uber out, send him home with a buddy, and you take care of him. It doesn't matter if you're in uniform or not. It starts here. Decide, communicate, and act. And that goes into this piece that I was talking about with combat. You do that in the air for those pilots. Logistics officers, you do it then. Intel, you make those good decisions so that us grunts on the ground, we know where to go and how to fight. But in every aspect of life, you have to make a decision, communicate it properly to your Marines, and then just do it. Okay? Who knows what I'm talking about? Charlotte Buff, you seen that video? Right? Just do it. Okay? Stop talking about it. Figure out what you have to do, communicate it to your guys, and just go out there and get it done. No excuses. And being a warfighter who embraces the warrior ethos. Sometimes we sit in these classrooms all day, 
We walk around, we, we go to these, the academy, right? Everybody's thanking us for our service, and we put on these nice uniforms. Sometimes we forget who we are. We're war fighters. We're the last bastion of war fighters and warriors that is going to protect America from whatever's coming. Less than 1% of America protects ourselves, and, that, and you're part of that. Okay, never forget it. Every day you put on your armor, and you go fight. Right? And lastly, mentally strong, physically tough. I think one of my favorite recruiting posts in the Marine Corps is we didn't promise you a rose garden. When you come to the basic school with us, you're going to be broken down. And you expect it. You almost want it. All right? If TBS is too easy or IOC infantry officer's course is too easy, you almost feel like you didn't earn it. Or if plebe week or whatever academy school you went to. Right? If it's too easy, you feel like you didn't earn it. Be mentally strong, physically tough. Okay. Next slide, please. These are just points, some points of guidance that I'll leave you with. This is what I give to all my Marines. Right? I've led platoons, I've led a company, and every single one of them, they know these five rules for me. Right? Know yourself. Know who you are as a leader. Okay? You're going to grow, you're going to develop, you're going to mature in the next several years, but never forget who you are. Right? I'm that southern kid from Savannah, Georgia, that grew up in the hood in Section 8 housing on food stands, getting my food out of the back of a truck because we're too poor. I never forgot where I came from because that's where your Marines are. Your Marines aren't going to be these stellar performers that you're going to see all around you. Everybody around you is an alpha, and they want to be better. But you're going to be leading Marines from single-parent homes. You're going to be leading Marines that don't want to be there, and this is the last option. How do you motivate them to take Mount Suribachi? Never forget yourself, OK? You're going to mature. You're going to develop. You're going to be a better leader, but never forget where you came from and who you are. Okay. Know your Marines. Why is that important, guys? Yeah, just like Gunny was talking earlier, okay? You got to know how to motivate them and talk to them. Everybody's different. And when I say know them, I'm talking about knowing them to their high school foot, down to their high school foot, football number. That's how much details you need to know about them. You need to know how many kids they have, where they're from, who's their wife, when's their anniversary, when's their birthday. What does that do for you when you know a Marine to that level? Why? Cadet? Yeah, is that they feel like you care. It is not a fake care. You truly care them and you love them. I'm a Marine growing up here talking about love and compassion. It's kind of crazy, right? But that's what leading is all about. It's taking care of those brothers and sisters that are around you. Okay? Use common sense. Often we feel common sense is lost in this world. Right? Please be that generation that brings it back. We're trying our best right now. Use that common sense. Step back, do the sniff test, and figure it out. Okay. Hey, don't be a jerk. What do you think word is supposed to go there, guys? Hey, don't be an asshole. Okay. <laughs> I can't put that on a presentation because I'll get in trouble. I can say it. Right. Don't be an asshole. Okay. Just think about that. Nobody comes to work every day saying, "Man, I'm going to be the worst Marine or sailor in the in the unit today." Nobody does that. So don't treat them that way. Everybody's got their life. Everybody's got something going on. Figure out how to lead them and reflect on yourself. How can you lead them better? All right, don't be that jerk. Come with a happy heart and fight with a happy heart. OK? Next slide, please. Ted. All right, this is my Marines. Second platoon, first time, eighth Marines. As he's scrolling through this, you see Sergeant Steinkamp, Vance Corporal Mills, Sergeant Vickery. Sergeant Steinkamp's in the back, Silver Star recipient on our pump. To the right, you have Eric Warren, Doc Eric Warren, Sailor, Navy, who are? Yeah. And Lance Corporal Stephen Sutton, both killed in action because of IEDs. Okay. Right in the center, you have Sergeant Egan, right? Lost both legs. Who heard in the video the guy saying, hey, get some dispersion? That was Sergeant Egan before he stepped on the IED. The last thing he said after he stepped on the IED and before we put him on the bird was assigning the next squad leader, hey, take these Marines home. The Lance Corporal that was right next to him, he grabbed him by the chest, no legs, two tourniquets on, and he told him, take the Marines home. 
Even in that environment, he was still caring more for those Marines than himself. Who does these 22 push-ups? Who knows what I'm talking about? The awareness, right? Corey Vickery came home. We caught him as much as we can. We took care of him. We tried to. Day in and day out, his Marines would call him, hey, you all right? How's everything going? But sometimes the stressors, you have to be there for them because they will take their own lives if unattended. Love them to the point, even when they get out, I still call my guys, and I know it's, it's kind of morbid that I do this. I'm like, hey, you're going to kill yourself? And they kind of laugh, no, sir, I'm good. Right? But that's the relationship I have with my guys right now. They know I care for them, and they know I'm checking in on them. Okay? You have to do that. Next slide, or next click. Right? It wasn't just Corey Vickery. It was his family that was left behind. His daughter. Right? The second you let up leadership, the second... You forget to lead Marines and you take care of them. You're letting America down. You're letting the sons and daughters down, the fathers, the parents. Next slide. Okay. This is the worst thing that could happen. But this is part of what we do. Again, I said two jobs for the military. We win America's battles, especially for the Marine Corps. We win America's battles and we take care of their sons and daughters. Did you do everything you could every day you woke up during the entire workup so that when you got to combat, you were able to make that quick decision so that you could bring them home? And I'm going to be honest, you're not going to bring all of them home, no matter if you did everything right, because the enemy always has their card. Right? So if you guys want some of those points, I can give them to you after we talk. But that's all I really have to say about leadership. It's not about you anymore, guys. You take care of those Marines and sailors. You take care of those airmen and soldiers. And you bring them home. Hurrah. Right. Do, do, we have, do we have time for questions? OK. The floor is yours. Hello. This question is for Master Sergeant Cuevas, and I was, oh, <laughs> I was curious, uh, what would you say the biggest lesson that you've taken away from your time as aide-de-camp to the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps? Um, so what can I take away from my time as the aide-de-camp with the Sergeant Major Marine Corps? Is that your question? Yes, Master Sergeant. Uh, he told me one valuable lesson. He told me it doesn't matter. He said everyone bring something to the fight. You know what that means, right? It doesn't matter if you're admin, like I am, supply, grunt, aviation. It does not matter. We are all fighting the same battle, right? One family, one unit, one team, one fight. When he told me those words, I never understood it until when I left him, I went to Iraq. And it clicked in. It doesn't matter what you do. That was the one valuable lesson that I learned from him. No matter what MOS you are, we all fight on the same battles. There's your question. Good rock. I'm coming. Please answer a question. These uniforms are tight. Please <laughs> uh, hear you. Good. All right, good. Uh, I've never met a Marine uh, that, or a former Marine that I guess you're always a Marine then uh, that I've never been I've that I've uh, not been impressed by. Uh, you, you all seem to have cracked the code more so than the rest of our services, including our own or my own, uh, in getting the your people to just take that character and that integrity and that professionalism and intensity all the way in and to own it all the time. And I guess I'm sure the Marine Corps has an answer on how they do that. I'm curious to hear from you all. What was the moment uh, when that happened for you that you just decided that you were a Marine all the way through? That's a good question. Uh, I think that's a good staff NCO question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Gunny, what do you think? <laughs> Thanks, sir. Uh, all right. So uh, I think that um, early on, 
I didn't really know what it meant to be a Marine. Uh, I knew that I'd have family in the Marine Corps. Uh, and so I went to boot camp with, with no expectations. And I, I think that was uh, what many go to boot camp with, uh, no or little expectations. Or you hear the horror stories of, uh, you know, you watch Full Metal Jacket or something like that. It's not really like that, thankfully. Um, but I think when I knew it myself was the, um, was when we did the crucible in boot camp. Um, some people are familiar with it, some are not, but it's essentially a three-day evolution at the end of boot camp in which you're put through stressful situations. You get maybe three hours of sleep uh, over 72 hours. You're carrying ammo cans. You're doing night resupplies. You're doing these tasks that are designed to be impossible to solve, literally impossible. There's no way to solve them. Uh, they're just designed that way. And when I knew the Marine Corps for me is when no matter what, no matter how many times we failed, no matter how many times we, we were knocked down, we all got up together. It took a lot to realize that, that not every single organization gets up together. Uh, you, know, you think about this. Uh, most of you have probably seen commercials with Dwayne Wade where he said, knock, seven, knock down seven times, get up eight. Notice he didn't say, my team was knocked down seven times, we all got up eight times. And he said himself. In the military in general, but specifically in the Marine Corps, you don't have that. You get knocked down as a team. Uh, I started to kind of expand on it earlier. As a leader, you should feel your subordinates' failures. You should experience that failure. It should feel like your own failure. You should, you should take that in and experience it. But when they succeed, you should give it all to them. And that's how you make them feel as part of a team. That's how you make them grow. And that's how I felt. When the drill instructors were taking us out there, we went through four or five different evolutions, which we failed completely, miserably. And the drill instructors saw it in our face. They're like, hey, you know what? You guys tried really hard. Keep it up. Keep up. As soon as we succeeded at something, hey, that was you. You succeeded. Not us, but you. And that's what I tell my Marines all the time. Uh, we just experienced uh, an inspection at the IPAC. Uh, in the Marine Corps, this particular uh, inspection is called the MCAT. It's the most prestigious inspection in the uh, administration field. It is the most difficult inspection as well. My Marines and the Marines of the IPAC scored the highest in the Marine Corps history of the inspection. Uh, not just the highest, but we blew it out of the water by 4%. Uh, what does that mean? That means where most other units are, are um, getting caught with $200,000 of overpayments or underpayments, Marines getting entitlements they shouldn't get, and getting checked hundreds of thousand dollars, we got $1,200. $1,200, we were off by $1,200. We take care of 6,000 Marines. That's the dedication that you see. That's, that's pulling together. When it came to the end, my boss came and he said, hey, who gets an award? I said, everybody. He said, well, we can't give everybody an award. He said, well, then nobody. Okay? And we all accepted that. We accepted that if not one person could be recognized, nobody would, but we would all be recognized by that act. So, does that answer your question, sir? Can I add on to that, sir? I think the, the other thing that we do in the Marine Corps really well is that, so I was actually down at Fort Benning for MCCC with the Army guys and uh, got to experience your side of things. Um, great, great stuff going on down there. But one of the things we do is we really enforce our history. Right? So what's going on next week, for those of you keeping up? Marine Corps birthday, right? Across the board, everybody celebrates our birthday. Okay? Every single Marine, no matter if you're in Afghanistan and you're busting out the MRE pound cakes and you're squeezing them together, right? you're standing there reading General Lejeune's message, you're still doing it. Okay? It's that esprit de corps, that, that love for it. That's what inspires them. That's what brings them together. The Army, one of the things you, you, you do is, hey, you celebrate the Ranger birthday, you celebrate the Strikers, whatever it is, you celebrate your individual celebrations, and there's not that cohesive unit, right? Bring it together. Read the history. Understand who your heroes are. Dan Daly, Smetley Butler, okay, Open May Johnson, right? Remind your Marines over and over again, Iwo Jima, okay? The only reason we're here is because we, we stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us, giants. And these giants are still here. Right? Talk to those giants before they're gone. World War I veterans are gone. World War II is quickly fading, and the Vietnam guys. Okay? Meet them, bring them in, talk to your Marines, and inspire them with that. Right? There's a lot of history, and how you bring a unit together and how you fire them up, as you tell them where they came from, 
and what's expected of them. So that's, that's one thing that I think is successful in the Marine Corps. Um, let me, while we're working the mic over to the next person with a question, uh, let me just say that uh, at one point I was a young lieutenant and they assigned me to a place called Paris Island for three years. And I can tell you that that opened my eyes when you watch how the Marines are trained, like you heard Gunny Shields talking about. When you see what they go through for 13 weeks, six days a week, and of course they're there seven, it's eye-watering. And I took those lessons the rest of my career and I pushed my Marines a lot harder because I knew they could do more. It was just an eye-watering experience. So it's amazing what goes on. Um, we have time for another one, sir? One more. Who's got the lucky last one? Okay. This question is for uh, both of the um, staff NCOs. If there, is there anything in particular that you wish you had known as a young NCO that uh, would have helped make you much more successful earlier on? You go first. Yeah, of course. I have many. Um, things I wish I would have learned uh, early on. Uh, reflecting back, there's a, a lot of things I wish I would have learned. Um, honestly, there's something I learned within the past year. Uh, it took almost 17 years to learn. Um, and that is I, ha I have a person who, I'm the type of person, I'm, I'm fired up all the time. I am ready to push the limits. And I, am, I believe in executing everything as it's intended, the most efficient, most expedient way possible. And sometimes that means uh, I, don't, I don't bend or I don't flex. And it also means that I, I hold those around me to the highest standards, or the, um, whether senior to me or, or uh, subordinate to me. Uh, recently, I had uh, someone come up to me and said, hey, you need to have the courage to accept your leadership's decisions. I was like, what do you, what do you mean? I always accept your decision. You tell me to do something, I do it. No, he's, he, he said, you fight about it. You argue with people. You make a point, you make a stink, and then you do it. I was like, well, what do you mean? And, you know, I just want to make sure that you're protected. I want to make sure that you're safe. Because as enlisted, that is our job. Our job is every day to make sure you as officers are not doing something illegal, immoral, um, or wrong, something that's going to get somebody hurt or killed. Uh, but it took me a long time to realize that sometimes that means just shutting up and doing what you're told. Uh, and it's very difficult. Uh, and I think it applies to not just... Uh, Young NCOs, it applies to young officers. You're going to be put in situations in which you're going to be like, man, this guy just will not listen to me. I keep telling him it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. Sometimes you have to have the courage to understand that they might know something more than you. And they're not always going to tell you. They're not going to always entertain your, your arguments. And when you do argue, and when you do fight back, and especially when you do as I have done in the past unwittingly, you let that seep down to your, to your subordinates. They hear you dissent. That dissent right there, that creates barriers between you and the person who leads you. I learned that while I didn't do that all the time, I learned that my outspoken behaviors can sometimes affect my Marines. Um, and I learned it, uh, just real quick, I learned it in this way. I was out at a, at a unit, I'm not going to say which because, um, because of the nature of this. We had an XO who was, we'll say, less than a stellar performer. He was... Um, I'm not even going to go any further beyond that. He just wasn't very good at what he did. And I had Marines come to me and say, at the time, Staff Sergeant, Staff Sergeant, I don't want to follow this guy. If he tells me to do something, I'm not going to do it. That is the hardest thing for a leader to hear. And I thought back in that instant and said, you know what? Where did they get that from? Because they don't just come up with that on their own. They got that from me, from the staff around them, from the people they heard talking about the leadership. I had to pull them aside, hey, listen, if you don't follow orders, that's, you can get NJP'd. There's nothing I can do about it. But it took those instances for me to realize that, that dissent, that unwillingness to, to instantly obey the orders without fighting, without arguing, and especially without doing it in front of my subordinates, that was the hardest thing. And that's the definite lesson that I take away. It's a lesson I try and impart on all my Marines now. So, like the captain said, when you're a leader, you're, you're dealing with multiple people from different backgrounds and how they are raised. I was that one individual. I, you know, poor family came in, came to Marine Corps, and they taught me stuff, and I thought that was the best thing since sliced bread. And I was hungry. I was a hungry leader that wanted to be on top. 
And one thing I take back is not listening to the people who are guiding me this whole way. You have to be open. Well, no one's perfect in this world, right? We all have to make mistakes. You have to make mistakes in order to learn from them. And hopefully you don't make that same mistake again, twice. Um, and as a uh, senior enlisted, it's our job, like the gunny said, is to make sure that the, you leaders are doing exactly what you need to, to take care of whoever you are in charge of, and vice versa. Every day, we must strive to earn each other's trust and respect. Every day, you have to fight for it. It's never going to end. As long as you keep that mentality, the faith of your junior Marines or your people under your charge, they will thank you for that every single day. Leadership is it, its hard. It's always continuous. You must strive for perfection. Strive for that love and confidence in the people underneath you on your charge. Right now, I'm willing to serve with any, each and every one of you. Just because you are wearing this uniform and an oath that you have taken, you are hungry. So I challenge you to lead me one day, lead those Marines, or lead the people underneath you to, to greatness. When you get out of here, you must leave your legacy. Always leave your institution better for the next generation of midshipmen. Does that make sense? Hoorah. Thank you. OK, I, I think that's, uh, I think we've done our duty. So Jim, I'll turn it back over to you. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, gentlemen of the panel. It was a great panel and a great way to end up our, uh, our uh, day here uh, at the Navy Memorial. Uh, I'm a Navy man. I was, I'm a former Naval officer. And uh, nonetheless, I have the greatest respect for the Marine Corps. My, my dad was a Marine. Uh, one brother was a Marine. Uh, we've heard from some very eloquent uh, Marines today. Uh, but I can't uh, end without telling this, this anecdote. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, I was a director of the White House Fellowships Program. And I got to know a guy by the name of Bud McFarlane. He was a, he was a retired uh, Marine Corps colonel uh, who was then uh, National Security Advisor to President Reagan. And, he's, and he had been a White House Fellow in the Nixon administration uh, assigned to uh, Henry Kissinger, who was Secretary of State. And uh, Bud recalled a, a meeting with the Chiefs of Staff uh, which was very contentious. It was over some treaty or something. And there was a lot of shouting and so forth. And they, the chiefs left, and Kissinger was just fuming. And uh, you know, he was cursing and throwing things. And finally, uh, uh, he calmed down. And he said, you know, in that German accent, you know, you know Bud, uh, the Marines are the only service I have any respect for. He said, oh, really? He said, yes, among all the services, they're the only ones that have, make no pretense to intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Bud said, to show, show you how, uh, how right he was, I took it as a compliment. So, <laughs> But uh, no, the Marines are great. There, there, there are no better. Uh, I'm proud to have you here, and Semper Fi. Who else, sir?